everyone. Welcome to our 25th Virtual Research Cafe. I'm Frank Gomez, Executive Director of STEMnet, along here with Monica Alacon, Operations Analyst here for STEMnet. Much thanks goes to her for working on the logistics and publicizing today's event. The goal of the cafe is to help foster research collaborations across the CSU and catalyze the submission of joint proposals. The cafe brings together CSU assistant professors to share their work in a relaxed setting for 10 minutes each, reason for the 10.0. We hope you find opportunities for collaboration and or learn about a new area of research that may impact your own program. Feel free to contact any presenter in the chat box when they're not presenting. At the end of the three presentations, we'll all come together to answer your questions. I'll also monitor the chat box to call the questions from the audience. So let's begin. Once again, we have three wonderful speakers from across the CSU presenting but a snapshot of their work. Our first speaker, is Dr. Anna Lee from the Department of Electrical Engineering at Cal State Long Beach. Anna, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. So uh, my name is Anna Lee from Electrical Engineering CSULB. I just joined the CSULB last fall, so I'm fairly new at CSULB. Um, I'm going to discuss about my overview of a research activities that is going to be ongoing. Um, but before I start, I was told that I should introduce myself about me outside of my work. Um, when I have some time, I have a five-year-old, so I like to uh, spend meaningful time with them. So the latest work that we did together was uh, this Wakanda Forever. So we like I like building Legos with him. That's the first one, and then here's also the Space Commander that we did previously. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, something about me outside of work. Uh, about me, uh, here's my research timeline. I have a fundamental basic science from my PhD working in uh, the areas of semiconductors, plasmonics, optics, and nanoscience. And building from that uh, basic work that I've done, I have some applied uh, experience as well in a postdoc photovoltaics, nanofabrication and technology, and energy storage, especially in batteries. Uh, as well as a nanofabrication and technology. So it is kind of a natural for me to pursue uh, energy storage and conversion work as well as a nanotechnology and solid state devices. So I worked in the University of Toronto, Argonne National Lab, and U Minnesota. Uh, so I have, uh, but then uh, my family wanted to move back to California. So I'm here at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, here's my uh, recent publications. Um, uh, it's not complete list, but I have a, uh, some publication as well as a conference and uh, recent patents work as well. So uh, here at Electrical Engineering at CSULB, I'm working uh, on nanofabrication and devices uh, to create uh, next generation devices. So I'm working on uh, new gen new next generation devices in the fields of energy conversion and storage, sensing in healthcare, optics and communication. And my approach is an interdisciplinary approach, working in basic science, the solving fundamental engineering problems to work towards next generation devices. So the long-term objective of my work here at CSULB is to discover fundamentally uh, new concepts and devices which can lead to disruptive advances and applicable and sustainable energy environment and healthcare system. And my short-term objectives uh, are currently, uh, I have a three thr a thrust in nanoplasmonics and energy work in a battery as well as uh, conversion. <clears throat> and the uh, applied targets are given here as well. Uh, Specifically, uh, the current projects that I'm working on right now in my research lab is the light detection and ranging of the LIDAR, beam stirring, ultra-sensitive biochemical sensor, plasmon-plasmon interference, 
integrated energy conversion storage and fast charging batteries. And then here are some examples uh, to showing the research work. Uh, more specific example that I can perhaps talk about is not published yet. So uh, I'm not sure how much detail that I can go to, but uh, in the case of the nanoplasmonics work, so uh, I work in the, uh, so plasmons are the nano size of metal nanoparticles. And uh, when metals are small, so in the nano size, it produces really, um, uh, produces a localized, well, in this case, it's nanoparticles. It produces a localized surface plasma. It's a surface charge on nanostructure. And what you see here is uh, the metal uh, nano rods. So you have a three arms at uh, the different frequency, well, different wavelength, 710 nanometer and 684 nanometer, showing the ensemble average of uh, localized surface plasmons. And what you see here is a finite difference time domain simulation of those gold nanorods. Uh, what I'm interested in studying here is um, study uh, electron density variation of these plasma structures. So we are investigating uh, different types of plasma structures to have a deeper understanding on electron density variations uh, through uh, different external stimuli uh, towards ultra fast modulation. <clears throat> Another example that I would like to talk about uh, currently, what we are pursuing is a uh, photo accelerated fast charging battery. Recently, I have we've seen we have discovered that a fast charging lithium ion battery, as an example, is possible through photon introduction to the system. And currently, uh, we are trying to understand and study the electron and ion motions directed by this uh, photon simulation for the energy storage material. And uh, what you see here is um, the AC impedance spectra of a Nyquist plot of showing the introduction of external stimuli, uh, such as photon, uh, significantly reduces the impedance in the system. And photoplot is shown in the inset as well. So, um, so th those are the research activities going on in my research lab since last fall. Uh, the equipment that I have, I, I'm at, look, my research lab is located at VEC 124 uh, CSULB. Uh, energy storage, concern I have a multi-channel battery tester so that's the eight channel but I have 10 of them so we can test the batteries I have potential stead with the EIS impedance spectral uh, impedance spectroscopy capabilities and I have uh, fabrication equipment some stops are still work in progress I just received the equipment last last week so I'm setting up uh, my lab. In the case of energy conversion is concerned, uh, I have a solar simulator with the external quantum efficiency, IV test modules and variable spectrum uh, capabilities and nanofab devices, optical tables and uh, various optics, spectrophotometers, LED measurements, elect electrical test boards and et cetera. And FTTD and COMSOL multiphysics are the capabilities that we have in terms of the software. Uh, future equipment uh, uh, through grants and also like to connect with uh, uh, all of you guys that uh, if you're interested in, uh, I'm interested in uh, getting FIP system, also atomic layer deposition and environment spectroscopy capabilities. I have submitted um, grants already and I have a more upcoming grants that I would like to work with you guys as well. Uh, so I would like to uh, connect with the research groups studying in the field of a thin film, uh, semiconductors and other types of the thin films, and also nanofabrication capabilities. Right now, uh, I have really awesome students and a group and collaborators, and these guys are some of the best, smartest students that I ever uh, studied and worked with. Uh, 
along with my five-year-old here. Um, right now, my students are going to UCI uh, to do fibbing. So I would like to connect with some of you guys who are interested in uh, expanding nanofabrication capabilities within CSU itself as well. So um, I'm actively working towards that. And I have a FIB. So I'm looking for FIB eBeam uh, writing capabilities if you are uh, if you have that capabilities, as well as a nano assembly uh, through bottom up uh, capabilities. I'm also interested in connecting with the energy materials fabrication groups to work towards uh, towards the energy conversion and uh, storage work. With that, uh, I'd like to thank all my uh, students. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer after all the presenters. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Anna. Very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, you know we can chat uh, chat offline. I have uh, some connections with uh, you know DMR related Mersex across the country. In case you have an interest in that, okay. So our next speaker is April Karlinski, assistant professor, Department of Kinesiology from Cal State San Bernardino. April, your turn. Earlier with my screen, let me just. Sorry about that. You might have to turn up the volume on your mic. Is that better? A little. It's still a little muffled. Can can you speak into your mic? How's that? Yeah, I can hear you, the, the background noise, but it's a lot better. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, okay, and sharing one title slide. I don't see your share screen. Okay. Interview or the slide? Um, just display at the top. So you could do the presenter mode. There you go. Okay. Let's get Thank you very much, everyone. Um, okay, and thank you for the introduction and for having me uh, start with a little bit of background about me. Um, I completed my PhD in biology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, with a focus on motor learning. So how people learn physical skills and how to design practice sessions to promote learning. During my PhD, I was also able to spend some time at the Social Mind and Body Lab at the Central European University in Hungary, where I really got interested in cognitive science and how social contexts influence all sorts of cognitive processes and physical behaviors. On to a postdoc at the University of Toronto, and as you just heard, Anna has a connection there too, so she'll know, looks more like this these days. And there I broadened my research scope by working in both the motor control lab called the action and attention lab, and also physical activity and mental health lab. From Toronto, I got to come up here to California in 2020 to start as an assistant professor in kinesiology. All this time, one of my main research interests has been how social contexts, so simply put, the presence of other people, Well, context for this interest is that when we look at the field of motor learning as a whole, we see that in isolated environments. In contrast, practice environments outside of the lab are often highly social. And in these types of shared practice settings, the presence and actions of other learners may affect the practice experience through a variety of mechanisms. So I've therefore been interested in exploring how motor learning principles based on research where people have been learning alone actually hold up and generalize to shared practice conditions, plus how we can maybe tailor these social settings 
to enhance learning. So that influence learning, but also at a practical level towards optimizing the learning that occurs in applied settings, such as PE classes or sports teams, as well as rehabilitation and work settings. One of my hopes is maybe there's some people in the audience who see a way that such social learning occurs in their field as well. And as well as we can see, social learning uh, can occur with any number of individuals, and there are a variety of ways that people can practice together. My research so far has focused on practice in pairs, where pairs take turns performing and observing one another. Show you is a simplified version of just some of the major variables proposed to impact on the learning that occurs in practice with others. And these include the opportunity for dialogue, for example, how learners can share knowledge and strategies, for audience effects, where the presence of another person may evoke desires to demonstrate competence and maintain a positive self-image, for motivational factors, such as the uh, potential impact of comparing oneself to other learners, spacing, which allows learners to rest between their practice attempts when it's a partner's turn, and for observational learning, such as when each partner serves as a learning model for the other. To date, I have focused in particular on the impact of observational learning during practice while attempting to control or measure some of these other factors. So, as I mentioned, in paired practice, each partner typically serves as a learning model for the other. This refers to the opportunity to observe one's partner engaged in physical practice, including committing errors and attempting to correct these errors, and hopefully improving over time. Watching the skill acquisition process is thought to allow the observer to engage in similar cognitive activities as the performer. Error detection and the consideration of potential corrective responses. They can also help observers to believe that they're capable of attaining the skill. We're, we're kind of losing you a little bit every now and then, April. Maybe if you can hold your mic constant or um, that help a little bit. Okay, thanks, Ray. I see that didn't help. April, you may just need to disconnect your microphone. I think your microphone is not working yeah. properly. I'll try that. <laughs> okay, so uh, with this brief overview in mind, the overall goal of my program is to gain a comprehensive understanding of the cognitive and psychosocial processes that underpin the performance you're still cutting off no April. that didn't help either maybe you do can you move. Have yeah do you have maybe any? You, yeah do you have any headsets or buds or can you move yourself closer to the mic on your computer wherever it is if you tap your laptop or wherever. All right, switching microphones. Any better? Yeah, that sounds you're, better. You're clear uh, now. It's just yeah. that you're cutting off every, uh, maybe like- Sorry, sorry about that, everyone. I guess this microphone doesn't work anymore. <laughs> OK, hopefully- You actually sound a lot clearer right now, so I think this might work. Yeah, you're better. Okay, fabulous. Sorry, everyone. If there's anything you'd like me to go back to later, I'd be happy to. Um, but just to touch quickly on a few of my current research questions. Uh, these are, how does a partner practice? Uh, you sorry, need to uh, show your screen, yeah. It's not showing anymore? I think we switched screens from what you were sharing. Yeah, we showed a, we see, we saw a big blue flower. What this? There. Okay. My goodness, this is not my best <laughs> presentation, but we will persist. Um, so a few of my current research questions. How does a partner impact performance and decisions during practice? Is paired practice more effective for learning than practice alone? And is paired practice more efficient than practice alone? And just a spoiler alert, the take home message from my research so far is that paired practice is in fact as effective for learning compared to practice alone and it's more efficient, as two learners can get to the same level of proficiency in the time otherwise devoted to a single learner. Just to illustrate what I mean, 
We can imagine that there are 10 learners who each needs a, a one hour practice session that includes some rest time. If they practiced alone, altogether that would require 10 separate hours of practice time and potentially 10 hours of expenses related to uh, paying for an instructor's time and facility rental or equipment. And in contrast, if we could have people achieve the same level of learning by practicing in pairs, this could potentially only require five hours of training time and associated costs. So efficiency can be valuable and establishing the mechanisms of efficiency um, and efficiency of paired practice has important theoretical and practical implications. Uh, this is particularly the case uh, and maybe very beneficial in applied settings where there are enforced delays between physical practice attempts, such as in uh, physi physiologically demanding activities where you need to allow learners to rest and recover, or when there are fewer instructors than trainees, or when equipment must be shared. And although I'm highlighting sports skills here, these principles should generalize across motor skills. For example, maybe to lab-based procedures or surgical skills and motor tasks uh, within some simulators or other complex environments. Leads me to some of my new directions and potential avenues for collaboration. As I just mentioned, I think there's a need to test the generalizability of these social learning findings across a variety of contexts. I'm currently collaborating with researchers in the Faculty of Music at the University of Toronto to study the learning of music skills in pairs. And I'd be interested in collaborating if anyone is uh, interested in exploring motor skills within different STEM fields. As social motor learning is a relatively new area of study, there are still many factors that need to be studied. Um, I have started testing cooperative versus competitive partnerships. But I'd like to explore as well the effects of a partner skill level, as well as implications for learners' motivation, enjoyment, and desire to continue in the learning process. I'm interested in broadening the idea of the social context. So not just uh, maybe the physical presence of others, but also to the online or virtual environments. Also began to extend my research questions to capture some of the psychosocial processes that influence motor performance and learning, including body image and body related emotions, as well as how attention on the body influences motor performance and learning. My research samples have primarily been college students, but there's a need to test um, learning and generalizability across other populations, for example, with youth and older adults as well. I'm currently collaborating with the University of Manchester to study motor behavior in individuals with autism, and I'd be interested in working with other special populations too. Yeah, my research to date has really relied on behavioral measures, so things like performance errors and movement times, uh, but I have now bought a screen-based eye tracker so I can assess measures of eye gaze when, for example, watching instructional uh, videos or uh, looking at different physique salient media, but uh, this could also be used for any types of stimuli or reading materials or other, um, other visual stimuli that people may be interested in exploring. So I'm happy to collaborate. I, I have this technology now, but I am new to it. So if anyone has expertise, I would also love uh, to, to work with you on that. And then my big ask is I would love to incorporate some neurophysiological measures to get a better understanding of some of the neural adaptations that occur with practice. I'm particularly interested in TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. So if you or anyone you know has access or interest in this technique, uh, please let me know. And it would be amazing to see some of the neuroplasticity that goes along with different forms of practice as well. Um, I'm going to end it there and thank you very much for your patience and your attention and uh, would be happy to chat uh, afterwards or offline if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, April. A very, very interesting presentation. I appreciate you giving some of your time today. Our next speaker is Gianmarc Grazioli from San Jose State University and um, from the Department of Chemistry. Uh, I like Department of Chemistries because I was in one for many years. So Gian Mark, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Whoops, I'm on the last slide. Let me go to the first slide. There we go. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, let me bring this back. Okay, now I'm ready. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Gianmarc Marc Grazioli. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to uh, talk to you today 
uh, about uh, some of my research. So uh, in, I thought I would start with, um, I thought I would start with this uh, project uh, because basically this one uh, came about because of a collaboration. And uh, I feel that uh, it's sort of, it's most closely, uh, you know, what I'm looking for in the spirit of collaboration today uh, with uh, these presentations, where basically a colleague of mine had run a bunch of simulations of acetaldehyde undergoing photo dissociation, and it would break up into one of four products shown here. So there's two bonds, either none of them break, one of them breaks, the other one breaks, or they both break. These oh, are basically- we don't, we don't see your, your, your PowerPoint, at least I don't. It stopped sharing? What in the world? Hang on, give me one moment, please. I definitely clicked share. Let's try it again. You see it? Now we see it. All right. Sorry about that. Hello. <laughs> My name is Dr. Jean-Marc Grazioli. Uh, I'm a professor of computational chemistry uh, in the Department of Chemistry at San Jose State University. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to present today. Uh, I thought I would start with this project uh, as it is. Uh, it came about because of a collaboration where um, a colleague of mine had run uh, simulations of acetaldehyde going, undergoing photo dissociation. So this is a pollutant up in the atmosphere. It gets hit by light and it breaks up into uh, different uh, components like this. Um, so the molecule, there's there's two primary bonds that break most frequently, and either one breaks, the other breaks, or none of them break, or both of them break. These are the four outcomes. And we couldn't really discern what sort of mechanism uh, was happening that, that would cause, you know, some bonds break and not others. It's very difficult to see what was going on. So basically, we thought, let's try and do some machine learning to find out what's going on here. And the specific type of machine learning I used was uh, support vector machines. So support vector machines... Um, the way they work, uh, well, so first of all, support vector machines are ideal for uh, training models on phase space. What's phase space? It's all the positions and all the momentum, uh, all the momenta of the particles in your system. That's what phase space is. And if you only look at the positions, then that's configuration space. And they also work great for that. And the way they work, the reason why they're so perfect, they go together like peanut butter and jelly, right? The reason for this is be based on how the models work. So um, a nice uh, heuristic uh, example that I like to explain it with is let's say you have a data set and uh, the inputs are latitude and longitude of different cities and the labels, there's two classes, uh, US city and Canadian city. And uh, you wanna train a model that can predict, uh, you know, you can give it a latitude and longitude of a city that it's never seen before. It can tell you if it's an American city or a Canadian city. So basically the way, um, the, the model works is it, it finds a linear combination of the training points themselves and constructs a boundary. It constructs, it guesses where the border is. So you can see why this is ideal for the, the model, that, the problem that I described of, you know, trying to figure out which class of country uh, a different, a, a particular position belongs to. And, um, you know, it, it, there's other ways of thinking of uh, spatial representations of your data. So it doesn't have to be exactly literally spatial. It's just a good example to teach with. Um, and what's great about this. So a lot of times there's, you know, we make the joke that in, in machine learning, the machine learns and you don't, right? So there are plenty of cases where people train these complex machine learning models that make great predictions and no one has any idea how it's doing it, right? So it, it, as a scientist, it could be hard to learn from that. Um, but the great thing about support vector machines is it's really easy to, to determine where you need more data. Let's look, let's say the, the model was making bad predictions, um, you know, up near, um, you know, let, let's say somewhere in the Midwest, right? It's making bad predictions there. And then you can find, okay, what are the nearest cities we have in each class there? Okay, maybe we can look for other cities that are in that area. So it can be a great uh, model for, um, interpretable machine learning. Uh, and so it works in phase space the same way. So this example on the left here is an example of a one dimensional system. So it's a two well potential, right? So basically if you imagine a marble that can roll back and forth there and it undergoes dynamics and then it lands in either the left side or the right side, if I plot the position and the momentum of that particle as it moves, now we're in two dimensions. And you see that we have a space here of the orange and the blue uh, trajectories that lead to either one that we could clearly separate just like a boundary of the countries. And so this is a nice low dimensional model that's great for making plots, but it worked just as well on a 42 dimensional space. So here we have acetaldehyde. So this is that molecule I told you about in the beginning. And I was able to train a machine learning classifier that could 
accurately predict what product you're going to get based on the, the positions and the momenta of the atoms early in the simulation. So basically, like if you look at like product one here, it was around 90% accurate just looking at the very first frame of the simulation. So without even running the simulation, you could know what product you, were, you would get. And I actually have a student in my group right now, uh, He Kun Cho, he's a master's student. He trained a model that's 99.99% accurate now on the first time step. So basically with him, I've been working with him and we've improved it. We've done more rigorous tuning of the model and uh, it's working beautifully. Um, and so again, you know, this is an interpretable thing. We can figure out where we need more data. So in terms of a collaboration, uh, you know, if the model's underperforming, it's pretty easy to figure out where we need more data. And then we can go back and forth with experiments uh, and figure out what's going on. And that's kind of ideally what I'm hoping to find is uh, folks who do like experiments where they're getting large data sets and they need help interpreting them or not necessarily need help. But, you know, that maybe maybe I could offer uh, some um, uh, contribution there. Uh, and let's see. Yeah, let's move on from this one. Oh, another way to interpret these models is using something, uh, principal components analysis. So if we have two clouds of points, right? On the left there, we have a three-dimensional space and there's two clouds of points. And let's say we're trying to figure out what degree of freedom is most important for determining, are we in the purple class or the green class? Well, you know, this is only three dimensions. We can eyeball it. Clearly up and down is the most important one, the Z. But if I project that into a, a two-dimensional space of the first two principal components, so basically we reorient our, our axes to capture uh, you know, the most variance and then the second most variance in the distribution, et cetera. Notice how if I trace along the Z here, it goes from purple to green. So clearly Z axis, the up and down, is actually the one that most determines what uh, class we're in. And again, less impressive in three dimensions, more impressive in 42 dimensions, right? So I did the same thing here. I took this uh, 42 dimensional space, mapped it down to uh, the first two principal components, and we were able to learn uh, sort of uh, which are the most important degrees of freedom for determining what product we're going to get. Uh, I do some work uh, studying amyloid fibril uh, formation. So amyloid fibrils are, you know, proteins stick together uh, and they form these long chains. So kind of like a crystal forms where, uh, you know, in three dimensions, the uh, a crystal has three axes of growth. A fibril has a single axis of growth. So it has this repeating pattern, but it only grows along a single axis. And to simulate these things forming, you have to be clever and develop coarse grained models. Because if you simulate every atom, you know, the heat death of the universe will happen before your simulation finishes. So you have to come up with of ways of, of moving faster. And so here is a coarse grain model where basically we propose different changes. Um, every dot here is a protein molecule. And uh, we propose different moves. We say, okay, form a bond, break a bond, right? We propose these different moves and either accept them or reject them based on the energy. So this is Monte, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. And uh, we can actually create models that self-assemble into amyloid fibrils, like you see at the bottom right there in the yellow. And uh, one thing that's very challenging with this type of modeling is how do you parameterize uh, the model? So basically there's nine numbers you need to come up with. Think of it as like the little knobs that we're tuning the model to produce these things. And so one thing that we've developed in my group is a genetic algorithm. So this is unsupervised learning where the model learns to tune itself. So if we look at the, the distribution over here, the initial one is in red, the final one's in like that purplish color. And you see that uh, essentially, you know, we, we started out with very weak models and then we evolve to ones that are like almost uh, averaging 70% accuracy. And um, basically we do this by making a bunch of models and we see which ones perform the best. It's think of it as a select, you know, it's evolution. It's natural selection. We say, okay, get rid of the bottom ninety percent of the of the bottom ninety percent uh, performers. Keep the top ten, and then we let them breed. So we have a breeding event where they exchange information between the models. We find models that are kind of in between the most successful models, and then we run that new generation. And in this model, we actually let the parents be immortal, right? So if the if the children don't outperform the parents, we let the parents keep going. <laughs> so um, you know, so not not you know doesn't follow nature there but you know who cares we're trying to tune we're trying to tune a model here so we can come up with our own rules of evolution um so that's a genetic algorithm uh another thing that i've done is with these network models uh as i work with them you know as a chemist i'm always like you know okay we're modeling the, the connectivity directly and the the actual space is is implied but we don't have explicit explicit space so because we don't have explicit space you know as a chemist this always kind of bugged me and i thought okay what if we could train uh, a neural net to actually take a network model and predict what the atomistic structure is. So getting a much more detailed structure out of a much less detailed structure. 
And so it used to be like if you saw a bad episode of CSI, they'd be like, enhance that picture. And then you'd get something going from left to right here. And you'd be like, oh, that's a bunch of nonsense. You can't do that. Well, now we can, right? This exists now. And it's the same principle. We do, But we do it going from uh, network models up to atomistic models. So basically, these coarse networks that basically are the amino acids near each other or not is basically the only thing you look at. And then you, uh, we can actually predict atomistic structures from that. Uh, another thing we do is simulations uh, where we can simulate an experiment. So here's an experiment where you use atomic force microscopy to push, push down on a fibril until it breaks. And uh, so one of my students wrote some amazing code. It queries the protein data bank, produces the structure, and then actually simulates breaking it. So this is pretty cool to watch. Uh, and then finally, another thing that I do uh, I recently published a paper in the Journal of uh, Chemical Education with four of my students. And, uh, you know, I create um, software for uh, training students so that basically if they do a computational chemistry lab, they're actually writing code and not just sort of, you know, uh, clicking around on, on GUIs. So I better stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very, very interesting talk. I, I certainly have some questions, but I'm going to, of course, defer to the audience here to ask their questions first. Uh, so the floor is open to anybody who has questions of the speakers and speakers can also ask questions of other speakers. So we'll open it up. Uh, I have a question uh, for Anna. This is a uh, high level question on uh, stationary versus mobile uh, sto battery storage. And uh, I, ma I imagine most people are focused on mobile for cars, but could you just give like a high level of what the challenges of, of both of those are? Or is that too broad? Yeah, can you specify the question? I don't uh, know how to answer the question. Well, um, so, um, or how about this one? Do, do you see more advances happening in uh, uh, mobile batteries versus stationary? Is that where most of the action is? Um, well, I'm focusing on uh, future electrical vehicles. <laughs> the mobile, okay. Okay, thanks anyway. But I can't say, you know, but I think, um, I think that's the near future uh, focus at this time, but also importantly, more of the um, affordable and um, energy materials. So materials itself, not just the technology. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions there? I think Peter has one. Dr. Grazioli. Yes. Um, you mentioned working with peptides, and I was wondering uh, which peptides you were referring to. Uh, sure. Uh, in reference to um, the, the amyloid fibril formation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we work with uh, some short peptides. Um, basically, we've, let's see here, the one. So the, the average length of a lot of these is maybe seven, eight, nine, ten amino acids long. There's basically there's we've been looking at um, structures in the protein data bank that were uh, measured using X-ray crystallography, and there let's see the one that my student was looking at. Oh darn! I don't have the exact one in this talk. I had that slide. Oh wait, maybe I have the slide down here. Uh, is there is there a particular uh, reason? Maybe I can help. Uh, because I, I can tell you the exact protein. If, if you want to email me later, I'll tell you the exact one from that image. But is, is there kind of something that you're uh, wondering? Well, I, I work with uh, peptides and chronic pain, so uh, uh, and uh, indirectly with uh, beta amyloid, but then also oh, great. substance P and, um, and uh, CGRP. So um, okay. those might be outside uh, your interest area, but perhaps beta amyloid. Yeah, the yeah amyloid beta. I've definitely done simulations on amyloid beta in the past, for sure. Yeah, I did another project that I didn't talk about today, where basically um, we used a machine learning technique called clustering, 
where um, we looked at all the pairwise distances between all the atoms in amyloid beta and ran a long simulation. And then basically we were trying to figure out like, uh, you know, is there, you know, so it's, it's intrinsically disordered. So it's moving all over the place, but are there um, structures that, that hang out for a little while, right? These transient structures is what we were looking for. So basically I ran a clustering algorithm to basically see if there's clusters there uh, that we can say like, okay, we over this whole simulation, there are basically seven clusters that uh, were the um, sort of the most common areas in configuration space that were visited. Trying to see if I have a slide here. Yeah, I actually have a slide. I can show it to you real quick if you like. Sure, I'd love to. Let's see. This slide. So this is a, a simulation that I did a while ago um, where basically this is what I mean by clustering is that uh, there are... So, just, so okay, so if you think back to the map of cities, right, you can imagine how you could guess where there's clusters of cities, right, maybe around a water source or something like that. And uh, so just given the points in space, you can do like, again, this is unsupervised machine learning. We just say, all right, how many clusters are here that best describe the data? And so that's what I applied here, just looking at pairwise distances between all the atoms. And we found however many there are here, <laughs> just eyeballing it. This, this, there's this many clusters. And then later I looked at the trajectory to see what, you know, what, what, clusters are we transitioning between? And another thing you can do with cluster analysis is I can take the centroid. So the center point of the cluster, what is it? And so that's what these um, that's what these configurations you see on the screen are. So not every configuration within this cluster looks exactly like that, but that's the middle one. So it's pretty uh, indicative of what's going on. Yeah, uh, so my uh, area of uh, app clinical application is to you know, try to uh, modulate uh, peptide functioning. And so uh, it might be interesting to measure, you know, pre versus post, how mm. that uh, the signature of, you know, whether that gets in, in terms of clustering. Um, so that's what I have in the back of my mind. And if you're interested, I'll, I'll back channel you. And yeah, feel free to email anytime for sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we can you. definitely talk more about it then and, and see if there's something we could do. Yeah, great. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Yazdan, you have a question. Yes, my question is from April. Uh, given the fact that she talked about STEM analysis or STEM research, would you please uh, explain what you meant by that, how you can uh, bring STEM into your research? Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Thank you. Um, so really, it's about motor skills. And uh, uh, anything that we do that needs to be trained or learned, instructed. I'm just uh, doing a chat right now with someone in chemistry who does pipetting. So any physical task that needs to be acquired undergoes principles of motor learning. And so you have to consider how do you instruct them? What type of feedback do they get? Who should they be watching if you're demonstrating? So all those types of things are things that I study often from, you know, in kinesiology, a little more stereotypical to have sports skills, but it's often still key presses on a computer task or other just manual or physical things that need to be acquired. So my, um, what I was imagining is that if there are such tasks that, well, I know many fields, dissections or, um, or pipetting or other types of things that protocols that need to be performed, there would be principles from the motor learning field that would uh, that could inform the best way to teach those skills. Uh, so that's what you know I'm interested in, and then seeing how well these skills that would generalize to different contexts and what factors are most important in different scenarios. For example, uh, what you mean is that for sports activity, for example, battle rope. For example, what is the best strategy to do battle ropes? That battle ropes? Yes, this is some kind of sport activity. Yes, exactly. Oh, battle ropes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah, it could be something like that. So if we're doing battle ropes, then maybe are you considering um, how the spacing you do between your sets could be yes, something exactly. things like distributed or massed practice would be something. Or maybe who are you taking turns with? Do you want to see someone who's maybe better than you? Is that motivating or is that demotivating? Do you want to work with someone who's less uh, good than you? Do you want to work with someone you're cooperating, you're both trying to reach a personal best or competing, trying to outperform one another? All those types of factors influence the 
performance and learning process? Do you want other people in the gym watching you? Or does that increase arousal positively or increase anxiety and decrease your performance? So those are all the types of questions that I'm interested in. Um, sorry, okay. sorry, let me check them through. I'll look at that in a moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I will thanks. definitely send you an email to see what can be done. Amazing, thank you. So, so April, you know, with that in mind, uh, mm -hmm. I'll get a question in here. Uh, you know, I have an NSF HSI STEM grant, mm -hmm. which has a focus on um, virtual augmented reality. And I know that has been uh, incorporated in a number, lots of disciplines, but also in, uh, in your discipline also. Do you have any ideas on uh, how you might incorporate, you know, VR, MR, XR, AR, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. into, into some of your work going forward? Yeah, I've been thinking about a few different things for one, or especially in COVID, this happened where we started going online. Like if you can't be in the physical presence of someone, either for health reasons or just distance or someone with a specialty or an interest that isn't available in your space, um, what is different, if anything, about the physical presence of someone in the room with you versus this virtual presence, either through VR or through, for example, Zoom, right? What is different if we were practicing together through Zoom versus watching each other, for example, pipetting or bow roping if we were Zooming together in the gym or something like that? Um, so that's one aspect. Another thing um, would be in VR is as well, you know, some of the things we want to learn aren't always accessible where we are or simulators are used, for example, in NASA, if you're learning space controls, that's often a principle of how do we set up those environments. Um, oh God, I was so scared that I was muted at the moment. Sorry, that wasn't a comment to me. <laughs> I've had enough problems today. Um, so that could be uh, a principle as well as I'm interested in working um, with avatars. So you can design these partners who, you know, in real life, if we're interested, you won't always have someone who's maybe better than you or worse than you, or maybe who matches you in gender or ethnicity. And some of these um, or these in-group, out-group variables can influence learning as well. So having the option to design avatars or personal trainers or exercise partners that have these different features, we could study then what best promotes uh, motor performance and potentially learning through those protocols as well. I think there's a lot of opportunities, certainly mm -hmm. in your discipline. You know, I've been involved in things that are in the areas of, uh, of chemistry and in um, construction and engineering management, where instead of going on site to actually do the tours, you have these virtual tours and you teach students that way, for example. Um, exactly. you know, also in, you know, geog geography, oh, okay. for example, and, um, you know, in physics. So I think, and then we wrote a proposal, which wasn't funded having to do with VR, uh, actually with somebody on your campus, uh, Mihaela Popescu on, uh, looking at, uh, the use of VR in, um, for students with disabilities. Uh, and certainly that falls into your realm. So maybe something that we, you know, can talk about uh, later in, in the area, okay? Yeah. I wanna, you know, quickly transition to, uh, to, to Jean Marx. Uh, I had a question here. You mentioned the determination of products and you gave uh, acetaldehyde mm -hmm. as an example. So what limitations do you have in terms of trying to do that uh, in molecular size, et cetera? I mean, how big of something can you actually look at? Yeah, and and also like uh, how complex uh, for the motions. So so for you know like maybe like an SN two reaction where something's coming in and not you know that's kind of a straightforward uh, simulation that you can initiate in such a way that it should go. So for for this one, uh, my colleague, um, so he's like an expert in density functional theory, and so he basically constructed a. Um, uh, a density functional basis set that was really good for modeling the triplet excited state for acetaldehyde. And he would start it with like high velocities. So like basically like high temperature. Um, and so for this, so basically uh, unimolecular re reactions are definitely a good place to do more stuff because, you know, you don't have to have like two molecules coming in at exactly the right trajectory. You know what I mean? Like we don't have to get a collision. So I think that's going to be a challenging area. That's something that I want to work on in the future. Um, but for, you know, like kind of a next good molecule to try, like something else unimolecular, uh, I was looking at um, rocket fuels that um, 
they don't combust they oh god what's that word oh they uh oh I'm, I'm, the word just went right out of my head but basically instead hypergolic. of what is it hypergolic you combine them and then they combust no that's not the word it's ba it's basically like in, instead of like uh new bonds forming and stuff like that they just blow apart um oh it, i'll think of the word as soon as this is over probably but basically it, it's a similar thing it's a rocket fuel that will kind of explode similar to how the acid aldehyde does here uh, so i think molecules that are that the reaction is unimolecular is a good one and you know maybe even something like a rearrangement reaction could work something like that where you're starting with a single molecule and you can kind of give it some high energy initial configuration and let it do its thing in fact that's a direction right there is um you know let's say let, let's say a rearrangement reaction right and you you're not sure how to initiate that thing so you initiate it randomly a whole bunch of different ways and you run a simulation and uh you know one of the molecules you know some of them do better than others and then you use machine learning to figure out like okay which ones were better for trying to simulate this reaction and you just iteratively get better and better there maybe that's my next project <laughs> um yeah so you don't you can just put me in the acknowledgments okay okay perfect so, <laughs> so uh a april there's uh i want you to address the uh, question from uh, so jennifer in the chat absolutely thanks jennifer for the question um <clears throat> sorry so uh on the point of interested in psychological empowerment concepts of competence yeah that is something i'm i've added in as well like often in motor behavior it was traditionally just measure the motor performance but now we're really trying to also capture some of these psychosocial and motivational aspects too so i'm currently using what's called the intrinsic motivation inventory and so that will assess learners perceptions of competence i've also created a scale well I adapted the existing scale to look at their perceptions of their partner's competence. So we can look at that and whether it relates to um, their actual capabilities or not. We're seeing that there's often a mismatch between people's perceptions of their competence and their actual performance abilities. Um, and I'm looking at you know, their interest and enjoyment in the practice, depending if they're practicing alone or with different types of partners, because that's a big thing too, right? It's all well and good if you're going to come and and do well for one practice session but if you hate it and you never want to come back that's not what we want for learners as well so looking at how do we provide the most effective but still um, overall enjoyable motivating experiences too so i haven't looked at just to address your second point the role acceptance i think that's a really cool idea i have done studies where um, i manipulate decision making in practice so i do self-directed practice where you can choose your decisions for yourself or peer directed practice where you have a partner directing some of your practice um, decisions. And there tends to be a preference to make your decisions yourself and be told what to do, but that's an area um, that I'm, I'm still continuing to, to pursue. Great, so I see she kind of went off. Perhaps you can uh, you know, email her with some of those comments uh, oh, okay. in the future, <laughs> <Thanks so much>. <laughs> okay? <Yeah>. And one, <laughs> sure. uh, this isn't a question, one, uh, the last one, uh, just a comment, you know, Anna, you seem more like a material scientist than you do an EE. Um, Want to comment anywhere there? Because certainly you're doing things that uh, I would think of you more in a physics or chemistry department. Yeah, um, I have a basic uh, background in the material science, especially focusing on nanoscience and technology and uh, semiconductors and plasmonics. Uh, so that's my basic background training. But then I have engineering training, which is actually much longer years than the, my PhD. So uh, I could go either way. <laughs> so that's why um, one of, uh, uh, for me, the way to solve this is some of the technological problems that I'm facing is through uh, fundamental uh, eyes classes. So yeah, so in the end of the day, I'm looking at um, enhancing the device performance, but I'm looking at the eyes of the science, if that makes sense. Great, well, I appreciate that. And you know, perhaps you can look at uh, you know, the DMR, I'm sure you already have the Division of Materials Research at the MERSEC, or uh, I'm still PI of a, the PREM program uh, at Cal State LA. And I think that'd be a, a route for you. You know, I found interesting your work. I've been working on microfluidic fuel cells and batteries as well as point of care diagnostics for over, I don't know, 13, 14 years now. Uh, I guess a real quick question is, why are Tesla cars so expensive? 
Yeah. <laughs> so again, I don't know how to answer that. Kind of, I don't because know. He's, because what? you said you did work in, in the, you know, in, in that type of, you know, battery system. Is it the, is it just because Elon Musk likes to charge that much or is the actual technology make it that expensive? Well, in fact, actually, he just decreased. Uh, he, Tesla just uh, they just decreased the price. You know. Yeah, but they're still <laughs> expensive for the for the middle class. They still are out of that right soft place for you know. If you get nothing in the Tesla, it's you know you're still going to pay you know eighty ninety thousand dollars for something. So it's just a question I threw out there because where I live down here in Orange County, you know, I see a lot of Teslas and. And they almost look the same, okay? So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, there are a lot of Teslas, especially in the Ubers nowadays. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, thank you for that. And I thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate that. And um, uh, just very, very quickly here. Um, Monica's putting some stuff in, in the chat. So we have uh, our next webcast, not Virtual Cafe is Friday, March 24th at 10 o'clock, NIH funded research in the CSU part two. And then on in uh, on April 7th, we have a virtual research cafe um, on that Friday at 11 o'clock. So I thank all of you for attending today. Looking forward to seeing you at a future STEMnet event. Take care and have a great weekend. Take care. <laughs>